All right, if you have a Bible with you today, why don't you turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22. This morning I'm going to carry on in the series that began last week entitled, The Thrill of Victory, The Agony of Defeat. Last week's message was entitled, The Thin White Line, and I talked about that thin line between defeat and victory, and how, specifically last week, we talked about how do you turn your defeats in life into victories. Well, this morning my message is entitled, One for the Money. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the story about this woman. She was an 80-year-old widow. She had been married three times before, each time widowed. She was 80 years old. She was getting married for the fourth time. The newspaper thought it was quite an interesting story. Imagine an 80-year-old woman getting married for the fourth time, and so they decided to go do an interview. And so they said, this is incredible. You're 80. You're getting married for the fourth time. What's going on? She says, well, it's like this. I've always planned my life very carefully. And when I was 20, I married the banker. And when I was 40, I married the circus master. And when I was 60, I married the local preacher. And now that I'm 80, I'm marrying the undertaker, the funeral director. <laughs> or in other words, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. And so this morning, I figured, you know, if we're going to talk about the agony of defeat and the thrill of victory, I'm going to do one for the money and talk about the thrill of financial victory and the agony of financial defeat. I think we've all had both, haven't we? I mean, you've all been there on the thrill of financial victory where you get a raise or you get a bonus or you made some sort of deal or sale or something and you're just, woo and you're dancing around your kitchen. I'm in the money. I'm in the money. You can't stop it. It's just coming out because you're experiencing the thrill of financial victory. But we have all, I'm sure, every person in this room, experienced the agony of financial defeat. We know what it's like to lose a job. We know what it's like to, some of you, to go through bankruptcy. We know what it's like to make a bad investment. And you can't believe what has gone on in your life. And there's also a song for that that you sing in your kitchen or your living room. And it goes like this. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. There you go. You've done... <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's over. <laughs> I, know what you're, I know what you're thinking. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this, this thing called money. We're going to do one for the money in this series because money is such an important thing. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes that money answers all things. And it's actually quite amazing that you, when you think of it, that Jesus talked more about money than any other single subject other than the kingdom of God. In Scripture, the whole of Scripture, New Testament, Old Testament, there's 500 Scriptures on faith, big subject. But there are over 2,000 Scriptures on money, wealth, and possessions. Why? Because money answers everything. Money is the thing that kind of makes the world go around. That's just the way it is. We're going to look at a little pearl of wisdom, just one tiny little Scripture today of King Solomon's. It's from the Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. This is what it says. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. One tiny little verse, absolutely loaded with universal truth. Let me tell you what the two universal truths of this. The first one is this, is that the rich rule over the poor. Is that true? You know what? It doesn't matter what kind of political system you have. As long as you have fallen sinful men, the rich will rule over the poor. You can have communism, you can have socialism, you can have capitalism, you can have a democracy or a monarchy. It doesn't matter. The rich are going to rule over the poor. It is called the golden rule. Anybody know what the golden rule is? I heard it. He who has the gold makes the rules. What do you think it was? And I mean, you look at life, the rich rule over the poor. But the second universal truth is this, is that the the borrower is servant, or some versions say slave, to the lender. How is it that the rich rule over the poor? I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how. They do it through the power of debt. What the rich do is they have the money, so they loan it to the poor, and they keep them as a slave. They keep them in, in bondage. And, you know, what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to be talking about the agony of defeat, and specifically I'm going to be talking about the agony of debt. And I'm going to talk about this thing called debt that many of us live with. And it's a burden that I don't think we should have to carry. Many of us carry this huge burden of debt. i got a picture for it. Here you go. Here's the picture of the debt that many of us have to carry in life. And some of us will carry it through our entire lives, our entire adult lives. And, you know, people, they don't realize the power of indebtedness. They don't realize that we become the servant to the lender. 
You know, people say, well, you know, I own this beautiful house. Do you? Try missing a payment, and you tell me if you really own that house. I, I remember I was driving down the street one day, and uh, there was this big, beautiful house going up, just a gorgeous home, and I'm a little bit of an extrovert. You probably know that about me. And so I drive into the guy's driveway, because I could see he's walking around. The house is about three-quarters of the way completed, and I was assuming that he was the owner of the house. And so I said to him, this is a fabulous-looking house. Is it yours? He said, no. I said, well, whose is it? He said, the bank's. And I mean, he was willing to admit the fact that that house wasn't really his. It really belonged to the bank. And if you don't believe that about your own house, like I said, just try missing a few payments and you find out who really owns that house. Now today what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk about mortgage debt. I'm not going to berate you about that. Because unless your name is Vanderbilt or Rockefeller, there's a good chance you will never own a house if you don't take out a mortgage. So I'm not going to, I'd actually encourage you to buy a house. I think it's a good financial move for people to do. I'm not going to talk about business debt, because if you're going to go into business, guess what? You're probably going to have to borrow money. You're probably going to have to borrow money to keep the thing going. That is not what I'm talking about here today. When I'm talking about the burden of debt, when I'm talking about the slavery of debt, what I'm going to talk about specifically this morning is consumer debt, because it's consumer debt, which is defined as the debt outside or excluding your mortgage. That's the kind of debt that kills people. That's the kind of debt that puts people in the bondage. And I'll tell you why. Because you have nothing to show for it when, you're, when it's all said and done. The, st the stats in Canada are absolutely staggering. The average Canadian, I'm talking man, woman, or child, owes $15,920 in consumer debt. You say, what do you mean by consumer debt? I'm talking, about, I'm talking about cars and furniture and appliances. I'm talking about your credit card debt. I'm talking about the fact that we live in a culture that you can virtually buy anything on credit, am I right? Anything. You can buy your groceries on credit. You can go on a holiday on credit. You can now pay your tithes on credit. <laughs> and you know you can do that at Church of the Rock. And so there's nothing you can't do with your credit card. There's nothing you can't borrow money to do in life. And so $15,920 per person. So that means an average family of four, that's $64,000 of consumer debt. You do the math, we are, we are half a trillion dollars in debt as a nation, collectively. $500 billion, and here's the tragedy to me. Many people will take that debt into their retirement, and some people will take it actually to the grave. 75% of all Canadians are carrying consumer debt. You know, I grew up in a household of, with a father who actually loved the power of borrowing. He, he loved debt, he, he borrowed money for everything. He borrowed money. He didn't buy anything without borrowing money. And he believed that what you should do with investing is you should invest other people's money. That was his ethic. And he trained us children with that. And he said, why would you invest your own money when you can invest other people's money? And you could buy stocks on margin call and those sorts of things. And so that's what he did. And he lived his whole life on debt. So here I am, a young guy growing up in that family. Guess what I do? I start borrowing money because the ethic of our family was you borrow to get rich. I managed to borrow to get poor. And many of you know what I'm talking about. And I was a young man of 24 years old, and I was hopelessly in debt. You know, to end the story with my father, when he was 72, my father passed away and was still massively in debt and still didn't have his home paid for. And so before that, at 24 years old, I'm already in the, the glue, and I've told you this story before, so I'm not going to repeat it, but let me tell you what I, the decision I made. Because I came, became a Christian, and I was reading the Scripture, and I came across Romans chapter 13, verse 8 where Paul the Apostle says this. He says, owe no man anything except to love him. I remember reading that for the first time and thinking, owe no man anything except to love him. That's how I want to live. The only debt I want to have to my world is the debt to love my neighbor and to love my enemy. That's the only debt I want to have. I am not prepared to go through life with this burden of debt. I am not prepared to live that way as the slave to the lender. And I made a determination at the age of 24 that I was going to get out of debt and to get completely out of debt, to have no debt whatsoever. Within 20 years, it took me 20 years, but after 20 years was completely out of debt, including retiring my mortgage. And don't look at me and say, well, you know, you're some fat cat TV preacher. I got news for you. I was living on a paltry pastor's salary that whole time and managing to do it. There are ways, there are methods in which we can get out of debt. And I would, I would encourage every one of you this morning as we're talking about this, what can you do to get out of debt? What can we do to release the burden of debt? And I'm going to give you a little bit of a picture today. I'm going to give you a word. 
And the word is stop. See, someone once said this. They said, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. So here I'm going to take this word, stop, S-T-O-P. I'm going to use it as an acrostic, and I'm going to give you the secret to getting out of debt. How you can retire somehow and get out of this consumer debt that many of you have found yourself in. So here it is. The, the S stands for SNP. SNP. Show the picture. There we go. SNP. What am I talking about? I'm talking about your credit cards. I have no beef with credit cards. I have credit cards. You probably have credit cards. I have no problem with you having a credit card. My concern is when the credit card has you. And there's a lot of people that the credit card has them. And there's really only one solution for them. And they've got to snip that thing up. That thing is killing them. What some of you need is you need a financial vasectomy. <laughs> you need to snip it and stop the production of debt is what you need to do. I know that's a bit crass, but I think I'm getting my point across, aren't I? And I think you're getting the picture here. Sometimes you just need to stop the production of that debt. And sometimes what you have to do is you have to snip up that card. And if you're responsible with your card, and if you're paying it off every month, then I got no problem with that. But if you're one of these people that is carrying this ever-increasing credit card debt, maybe what you need to do is snip that thing up. And you need to end it and start living a different way. That's not living by faith, living by credit. That is living as a slave to the lender. Let me tell you what is so insipid about the, the whole, or is insidious rather, about credit card debt, is that they send you these letters, you've all had them, where they send you a letter and they tell you that this month you only have to make a minimum monthly payment. And you go, wow, wow. Let me explain to you how that happened. You see, what happened was the president of Visa was sitting there one day in his big office and he was going through some of these bills and he came across your, your visa statement and he went, wow, look at the poor Smiths. They're in so much trouble. What do you say we write the Smiths a letter and tell them they can make a minimum monthly payment of only $30? And 30, so, they, they sent, so he sent that personal letter to you. And you go, honey, look at this. The president of Visa himself has, wants to give us a break. They feel bad for us, and they're going to let us get away with only a minimum monthly payment of $30. That's because they care for you so much, the same way a drug dealer does. Because what he's trying to do is they're trying to get you hooked on the debt part of this. See, let me ask you a question. How many of you know what the prime rate in Canada is right now? Prime bank rate is? 3% is what it is, approximately. That's the best rate that the banks give to their best customers is 3%. You can probably get a mortgage for about 3%. Someone tell me what the credit card interest rates are right now. 19 to 20%. Doesn't matter what card you have. It's 19 to 20%. There's a big gap between those two things. Let me make something clear to you. The bank actually doesn't want you to pay off your credit card. They don't care if you ever pay it off. They want you to get you hooked in like a drug dealer into that high interest compounding rate at 20%. And if they can keep you there for the rest of their life, they can make more money than you can shake a stick at. See, the average Canadian has a $4,000 limit on their credit card. Do the math on this. If you get into that minimum monthly payment thing, if you start paying only the interest, $4,000, and if you never pay that off and only pay the monthly interest on that, by the end of 10 years, you'll have paid at 20%, $20,000 in interest alone and still have not touched your debt of $4,000. Do you see what I'm talking about here? They don't actually care if you pay that off. What they want to do is get you trapped. They want to get you hooked. And there are people in this church, and I know because I've talked to many of you, and you have been sucked in to the credit card trap, and now you found yourself under the burden of this. And when I read this scripture, that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you know what, folks? It's time to snip it up. It's time to end it. You know, I had this guy, he tell, told me one day, he said, he said, my wife's credit card got stolen. I said, did you report it right away? He said, well, I was going to at first, but then I realized the thief was actually spending less money than my, my wife was. <laughs> that is, actually wasn't a true story, but let me, <laughs> let me tell you a true story. This is an absolute true story. I went into the store one day, I don't remember what store it was in, and uh, it was in the day of swiping the card, and I swiped the card, and she gave me the receipt, and I signed the receipt like you do. And then she looked at my card and she said, excuse me, sir, the signature has worn off the back of your card. That's a bad sign in itself. She says, the signature has worn off the back of your card. She says, you need to sign the card. I said, 
Why? She says, so I can verify that it's your signature. I said, really? She says, yes, I need to verify this. I went, okay. I mean, I just finished signing the bill. And so I took my credit card, I signed my name on it. She, this is honest to God truth. She took the credit card, took the bill that I just signed. She compared them and she looked up to me and she said, they're a perfect match. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> but that's not the worst story. Here's the worst story. So I'm in the grocery store. I'm swiping the card, and you know, I'm kind of stupid with these things. I'm swiping it upside down, I'm swiping it backwards, I'm swiping, I'm swiping, I'm swiping, I'm swiping, it's not working. The clerk is getting annoyed, there's a line behind me. So she turns to me and she says, strip down, face forward. I said, strip down, face forward? That's getting a little personal, isn't it? What, what am I gonna do? We needed the groceries, so I went for it. So the S in stop stands for snip. That's the first thing you need to do. The second thing, the T in stop, stands for tithe. Let me show you the picture. There it is. <laughs> tithe, for a cleaner, fresher soul, add 10% or more for better results. Probably out of everything I'm going to say today, there's probably nothing more important than learning this principle of tithing. It's an amazing thing that happens when we begin to tithe. When we begin to give 10% of our income to the work of God, God begins to work in our life. See, what happens is this. We move from the natural economy into the supernatural economy. Let me tell you something. I have people tell me this practically every week. They say, Pastor, you don't understand. I can't afford to tithe. To which I say to them, no, you don't understand. You can't afford not to. Because when you are not tithing, you are not in God's covenant financially, and you are not reaping the benefit of God opening up the windows of heaven. See, let me ask you a question, because I know there's a bunch of people in here that have already figured this out. And let me ask you this question. How many of you, have, since you started tithing, have found that you can live better on the 90% now than you could on the 100% before? Let me see your hands. Look at all those hands going up around this room. They're living better on 90% than they were before on 100. What's wrong with them? Are they, are they crazy? Actually, yes, but that's a different story. It's un I know some of them. But they have learned something. They have learned a principle, and they have learned a financial miracle principle that just works. And just so you're clear on this, a tenth is a 10%. It's giving a 10% of your income to God's work, and when you do this, God will do things in your life that you can't even imagine. Let me remind you what it says in Malachi chapter 3, and in, and in verse 10-ish, uh, it says this. It says, will a, will a man rob God? He's saying, what way have we robbed you? And you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Even this whole generation, you are cursed with a curse. Therefore, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. There, there may be food into my house, and I will open up the windows of heaven for you, and I will rebuke the devourer for yourself. And this is what he says. He says, prove me now in this. He says, prove me. You know, it's the only place in all of Scripture where God says that you can prove him. You can test him. He says, test me on this. You try this, and I will show you that I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing for you. You will not have room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for yourself. What is the devourer? Anybody know what the devourer is? You all know what the devourer is. See, you know, when people tell me this, they say, you know, Pastor Mark, this tithing thing, 10%, that's outrageous. And I say, no, the devourer, that's outrageous. You see, there is this thing, he says we are cursed with a curse. What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that in the garden on the fall, the ground itself got cursed. Thorns and thistles that will bring forth all the days of our life. We are living under a financial curse. God says, here's the deal. If you will give me 10% that actually belongs to me, he says, I will open up the windows of heaven. I will pour out a blessing on you. You won't have room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer. I will rebuke the thorns and the thistles. In agricultural terms, we know what that means. That means the pestilence and the bugs and the diseases and stuff that ruin the crop. But today, what does the devourer look like? You've all seen it. It's when your car breaks down, your washer breaks down, your hot water heater breaks down, your fridge breaks down, all in the same week. And you're going, what's going on? This is like the worst day of my life, all of this stuff breaking down. See, let me ask you a question. How many in this room have ever suffered the indignity 
of having to replace the transmission in your car. Let me see your hands. Oh my goodness, I can't think of a more painful thing. Maybe going to prison, but I doubt it. <laughs> there is nothing like, there's nothing like the tranny going in your car. There's nothing like it, it is so expensive. I mean, here's how it works. You're driving along, you know, the car's working fine. Then it stops working fine. You go to the transmission shop. They say you need a new transmission. Give me all of your money. That's, that's how much it is. It'll be all of your money. Give me all of the money you have. So you give them all of your money. You go to the bank, you give them all of the bank's money. You get your car back. It looks the same. It runs the same. It doesn't run any better than it did before it broke down. It just runs the same, looks the same. And you're thinking, I gave them all my money for this? I'm just back where I started. For to me, I think there should be a law requiring if you get a new transmission, they have to give you a free paint job. So at least you have something to show for it, right? You know, for me, I'd get my tranny done in my, my minivan. I'd get it painted Ferrari red. I'm done with the white. I want Ferrari red. I'll be going down the street, my Ferrari red minivan. I'd get that little horse symbol on the, on the front. People going by, whoa, Pastor Mark, new tranny, eh? Yeah. I went with, the, went with the Ferrari red on the transmission job. At least you have something to show for it. You know what I'm talking about. The hot water tank breaks down. You got hot water, then you don't. You give them $1,000, you have hot water again. How many of you, after you change your hot water tank, you go down and you look at it? Oh, it's so nice. It's a beautiful hot water tank. I hate the hot water tank. I didn't even know I had a hot water tank until it broke down. What, no hot water? The city's not giving me any hot water. No, that's produced in your basement in a tank. You have to buy another one, $1,000. $1,000, $1,000, $1,000. You know what the devourer is all about? God says that he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. You see, there's something that happens when we begin to get involved with God's economy. And I know I can't make you tithe. I'm not going to try to make you tithe. I'm just trying to encourage you that it is a principle that once you get on God's side of it, it begins to change things. But here's the thing you need to remember. The tithe comes at the beginning, not at the end. It's the first tenth. How many remember that story of, of Elijah when he um, met up with the, what they call the widow of Zarephath? The Z widow of Zarephath was, uh, in, it was in the middle of a drought. The drought had been gone on three and a half years. And uh, Elijah shows up at her house. Now, there she is. She's the mother, and she's a widow, and she's got a little child. And uh, Elijah shows up at her house and says, give me something to eat. There's a drought going on out there. And she says, if you'll remember the story, 1 Kings 17, she says, no, you don't understand. I got this little bit of oil, and I got this little bit of flour, and I'm about to make two small cakes, and then me and my son are going to eat them, and then we're going to die. To which Elijah says, yeah, that's nice. Uh, feed me first. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, just imagine this picture, eh? I, that's all we got. We're going to eat them and die. So he sits down at the table, gets out his fork and his spoon, and says, yeah, okay, uh, make me something first, because I'm really hungry. Feed me! I'm starving! You know, typical guy, eh? Sits, he can't think of anything else. He's hungry. The most insensitive, unbelievably selfish moment in Scripture, Elijah demanding that this woman feed him first. Or was it? Did, she, did he understand a principle of giving of your first fruits at the beginning so that God can multiply the rest of your fruits? And so what happened? I don't know what she was thinking. She's thinking, what a jerk. So I don't live another day, I'll feed the jerk. So she goes, <laughs> makes the cake, gives it to him, he eats it. How many remember how that story ended? That little vial of oil and that little jar of flour lasted three and a half years until the end of the drought. What happened? She had tapped into the supernatural economy of God because she first gave towards God's work. It's a principle, people, that if we get a hold of it, it'll change and transform and revolutionize your life. Let me tell you the story of James. James grew up in a Mennonite family in southern Ontario. When he was 29 years of age, in 1903, he moved to Chicago. He decided he was going to make his fame and fortune in the big city, and so he moves to the city. Uh, he tries to get a little business going, so he decides he's going to buy a horse and a cart. Uh, he paid $65 for the horse and cart, which was a ton of money, in 1903, and he started selling cheese out of the back of this cart. 
After two years, he was hopelessly in debt. After two years, he was broke, it wasn't working, he was just in a terrible situation. So he turned to the horse and he said to the horse, Patty, something's got to change. He waited, but the horse didn't say anything back, which is probably a good thing. The next day, he's in church, and one of his friends comes up to him and says, James, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. You forgot to make God your partner. And if you would honor God in your business, God would honor you, and you'd see this whole thing turn around. So he thought about it, and he thought, you know what, it's right. Here I am, I've been so worried about myself, so worried about my debts, I haven't been honoring God. And so he decided to make that change, and he started tithing of all of his proceeds, all of the income, even though he had this huge debt, he started tithing. And within only a few months, the business began to turn around. And within a couple of years, the business was booming and booming, and his, his brothers joined them, and they incorporated the company, and they actually ended up buying their own cheese manufacturing plant. And today, this company is the second biggest food company in the world. They have 90,000 employees in 70 different nations of the world, and they had sales last year of 34 billion, with a B, dollars in sales last year. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm talking about J.L. Kraft. You know, Mr. Cracker Barrel? You know what's going on. His whole life turned around when he began to exercise the principle of tithing. I've got to tell you this story. Going to be way off base here. I don't care. Happened last night. There's this couple sitting there in the front row. And uh, they tell me this story about how they were eating one day and they decided they were going to melt some cheese whiz, craft cheese whiz, on uh, some meal they were having. And so they went to the fridge, and as fate would have it, there was a jar of cheese whiz. They opened it up and they melted it down and had this meal, and they said it was delicious. And after the meal, they said, you know, I wonder how long that jar's been in there. We haven't had cheese whiz for a long time. He went back to the fridge. He checked the best before date, and it said May 2009. <laughs> the cheese whiz was four and a half years expired. It was probably five years old. Five-year-old jar of cheese. And so he's telling me this story, and I said, how was it? He said, it was fine. It was delicious. And I thought, how could this be? And of course, you know, inquiring minds want to know, my mind want to know. I thought, how can cheese last for five years? I go and buy a block of cheddar cheese in a week, it's all moldy and I have to throw it away. So I started looking around to see what I could find. I found an article in the National Post, no less, about the inventor of Cheese Whiz, Kraft Cheese Whiz. In the 50s, he worked for Kraft. Actually, his name is Dean Stockworth. He worked there for 38 years. He invented Cheese Whiz. And the story was about how now he's retired, living in Florida. He had a craving one day for some cheese whiz on bread, went down to the store, bought a jar of cheese whiz, spread it on his bread, took one bite and almost gagged. He said, it tasted like axle grease. He says, what have they done to my cheese? So he contacts the Kraft Food Company, tells them who he is, says, what have you done to my cheese? You've changed the formulation of, of cheese whiz. It tastes like axle grease. He does a little bit of investigation. Now, don't miss this story. I'm talking about the inventor of Cheese Whiz. He does a little bit of investigation, and he finds out that they have changed the ingredients, and they had left out one particular ingredient that they used to put in Cheese Whiz. Guess what it was? Cheese. cheese. It's got no cheese in it anymore. They took the cheese out. That's why it doesn't go bad. It's basically plastic is what it is. Orange plastic in a jar. It will last virtually forever. I want you to think about this. You take cheese out of cheese whiz, what do you have left? Whiz. Just whiz. <laughs> That's it. What do you call an empty jar of cheese whiz? That'd be cheese was, right? <laughs> Which essentially, if you think about it, is what they should be calling it now. Anyway, I have, thank you for indulging me in that little story. That was so much fun. So the S in STOP stands for SNP, the T stands for, for tithe, and the O stands for organize. Organize. How many remember this story? Here's the picture I've got up for you. Isn't that a great picture? There's debt. You can defeat, defeat and devour debt, but you're going to have to organize. I think probably everybody in the room remembers the story of Joseph. Joseph finds himself in Egypt, and they're going to go through a big trouble. They're going to have seven good years and seven lean years, and what does Joseph do? 
He organizes them. He organizes the whole nation and changes the fate and the future of a whole nation because he organized. He didn't change the circumstances. The circumstances remained the same, but they weathered the circumstances because he organized. Some of you need to write this down. I'm going to give you the ABCs of getting out of debt. Here they are. ABCs. This is where they are. A is advice. You need to get advice. If you're massively in debt, you probably need to talk to somebody. You probably need to go to a, a, a debt counselor or a financial counselor. You need to talk to someone who knows more about this than you do because you're not getting her done on your own. And so you need to get some advice. Look at this. The Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, what did he do? He went to Joseph and asked him for advice and, and, and he took the advice. He took the advice. So the A stands for advice. You've got to get some advice. The B stands for budget. Joseph put the entire nation on a 14-year budget. Right, he said, okay, we're going to have seven good years, we're going to have seven bad years. What did Israel do in the meantime? Israel did not do that, and after seven years, they were out of food. But Egypt wasn't because Joseph had put them on a ration, he had put them on a budget, he had determined what they were going to spend. See, unless your name is Richardson, you probably should be living on a budget. You know, unless you're extremely wealthy and have money that just comes in and comes in and comes in, most of us are, guess what? We're just going to have to live on a budget. We're going to have to know how much is coming in and how much is going out. It's called a budget. It's not that complicated, but that's the concept. So the A stands for advice. The B stands for budget. The C stands for consolidate. If you have got a bunch of huge credit card debt, if you've got a bunch of these 19 and 20% uh, interest rate credit cards that are devouring you, it's time for you to consolidate those loans. It's not, again, that complicated. You can organize this. You can go to the bank and get a consolidation loan and start paying a lower rate. Once you've snipped up the cards, you start paying a lower rate on your credit card repayment plan. Uh, it's done all the time. You can do it. You can make deals with the bank. You can make deals with the credit card. You'd be amazed at what you can do, but you need to learn how to consolidate. The ABC is so, so simple. And if you can remember those three letters, you can probably change your, your situation right where you are. Let me tell you an amazing story about this. And the woman's name was Francine Bostick. She was a uh, custodial person, custodian, is what she did for a living. She had 13 credit cards. Uh, she kept on getting them. If someone would give her a credit card, she would get them because she basically lived on credit cards for many years of her life. By the time she was 57 years of age, she was $120,000 in debt. She's 57 and she's 120,000 on credit card, just credit cards. $120,000 in debt. And you know what the worst part of this is? She had nothing to show for it. She had no fancy car. She had no big screen TV. She didn't have new appliances. You say, what did she spend all that money on? Living. Just living. She just bought the groceries and did the stuff and went through life. And when she would max out one credit card, she'd go get another credit card because they're always willing to give you credit cards. And she just did one credit card after another after another. So she did the, she did the ABC that I just gave you here. First thing she did was this. She went and she got some advice, and they said, you ought to snip up those cards. She snipped up all 13 cards, put them in a shoebox as a reminder. She still has the cards, but they're all snipped up. So she got some advice, and they, they told her this. They said, look, you have really one of two cho choices. You can, you can actually declare bankruptcy, but there's a whole other group of problems associated with that. Or you can bite the bullet, and you can do what you need to do to organize to get out of debt. And she says, I want to do that. This is my debt. I want to take responsibility for it. So that's what she did. So she snipped up her card. She got advice. She went on a very strict budget. She actually got a second job. She was working as a janitor. She got an evening job as a janitor. Her husband actually was disabled and only could work 30 hours a week. And yet they worked at it very hard. She, because they were on such a strict budget, then what they did, they were actually able to put aside $2,500 every month that went towards the credit card debt. After five years, they had paid off all $125,000, or $120,000, every single, they were completely debt free. She was 62 years old. She had worked like a dog, but she got there. And people asked her and said, well, did you make the right decision? She said, absolutely. It was my debt. I'd got myself into the glue. I needed to get myself out of it. And she says, I am finally free. And when I do retire, I'm going to be able to retire debt free. You see, that's the power of being able to consolidate our debts, to be able to budget our life, to be able to get some advice. Whatever situation you were in, you can get out of it. You know, I had a friend of mine, he was, uh, had a business deal go very bad on him. He was actually $4 million on his business, $4 million in debt. And I said to him, how can you even sleep at night? He said, Mark, let me explain something to you. When you're $40,000 in debt, you can't sleep at night. 
When you're $4 million in debt, your banker can't sleep at night. <laughs> So the S stands for SNP, the T stands for Tide, the O stands for Organize, and the P stands for Prayer. At the end of the day, we need to pray. And pray, actually, when you think about it, it's the easiest thing we do, because you actually let God do the rest. This is essentially the process. You do what you can do, and when you have done everything that you can do, then you leave the rest up to God. You just leave the results up to God. How many remember that story of, of Elisha? And uh, he came across a prophet, and the prophet was building a house, and he was using the axe, and the axe head flew off the axe and landed in the, in the river or the pond or whatever it was, sunk to the bottom. Do you remember that story? And so he's all upset, and so Elisha does a miracle, and the axe head floats to the top, and he goes and gets it. And I don't know about you, but I've read that story, and I thought, that seemed like a rather frivolous miracle. But God performed a miracle of causing an axe head to float. I don't know if you read the rest of the story, because the reason the prophet was so upset was he said this to Elisha. He says, alas, master, for the axe was borrowed. It was a borrowed axe. He had lost the axe head of an axe that he had borrowed from somewhere else. He had to repay this. So don't miss the miracle here. You know what the miracle is? God floated alone. <laughs> That's a lot funnier than you're giving me credit for. That's good stuff. I'm doing a lot better preaching than you are laughing. <laughs> There's another story as well, and that, that particular story I just told you was in 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we saw it again. Elisha came across the woman, and actually she was a widow as well, and she was in debt. And the problem in that situation was that the creditors were come to take her sons away as slaves because the borrower is slave to the lender. And she was actually going to lose her sons. And Elisha comes by and says, what do you got? And she says, just a little oil. And they go, and you remember the story, they gathered all these jugs, every jug she could find. And she poured the oil. And as long as she kept on pouring, the oil kept on flowing. And it filled one jug and filled another jug, jug after jug after jug after jug. And then when they ran out of jugs, the oil stopped flowing. And Elisha turns to her and says, now go sell the oil, pay off your debts, and live out the rest. I don't know if you've ever noticed the ramifications of that story. That was a supernatural debt repayment. Elisha prayed, and God did a miracle, and this woman's debt got retired, and she got out of debt. You know, last night I was telling these stories and preaching on this message, and there was a woman came up to me. She's the same age as I am, actually. And she came up to me, she's single, she lives alone, and she came up to me and she said, Pastor Mark, you actually don't know this about me. But she says, I live on $12,000 a year. I said, how can you live on $12,000 a year in today's day and age? She says, you know how I do it? She says, stop, S-T-O-P, exactly what you just said. She said, everything you talked about is what I do. She said, years ago, I snipped up my credit cards. She says, even though I only make $1,000 a month, $100 every month goes into the church offering because I will not neglect to tithe, even though I only make $1,000 a month. She says, I've organized my life very carefully. She says, I live very frugally. I eat very carefully. I shop very carefully. Do you know that this woman has a, owns a house and has a mortgage and owns an old car, but it's a car and has to run that car and put gas in that car? And on $12,000 a year... And I said, that's absolutely incredible. She says, that's what my accountant, he's a friend, he does my taxes for me for free. And she says, every day, he just, every year rather, he's looking at this and he shakes his hands, shakes his head rather, and says, this is impossible, this is impossible for you to live like this. And she said, I know. That's why I believe in the power of prayer. Because with God, nothing is impossible, and all things are possible to them that believe. And God gives her year after year, month after month, week after week. God gives her the miracle. And today, she's a walking testimony. She's an I do just fine. Because she has figured out how to get out of debt. She has figured out how to snip up the cards, how to tithe, how to organize, and how to pray. Because God still answers prayer today. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment, if you would. Because I know there's people in here today that have never invited Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. This whole thing begins with a relationship with a God who cares about every part of you, spiritually, 
physically, emotionally, and financially. And if you haven't made that and begun that relationship with Jesus, today would be a great day to start. I'm not going to call you forward or single you out. I'm not going to ask you to say anything publicly. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you'd like to make a decision to be a follower of Jesus, I want you to just slip up your hand right where you are. I won't call you forward. Right where you are. Just raise it up right now so I can see it. Just take a moment. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you at the back. Anybody else want to join these folks? Thank you in the middle. All right. Anybody else? Just take a moment. Thank you on the far side. All right. You can all put your hands down if you would. Let's pray together because I said I wouldn't single anybody out. While we're praying this prayer, there are some of you here that are really in the glue on debt. And I want to pray for you as well and have you to pray for yourself in this prayer that God will help you and do some of the things I talked about today. So let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, I confess I've been a sinner in need of your forgiveness. And you died on the cross for me. You rose on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. Father, help me to live a life where I would know, owe no man anything except to love him. Father, I submit my finances. I submit my debt. I submit it all to you. And I say, Lord Jesus, help me to get free. Help me to be able to say that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And today, I am free. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand, shall we?